All right, let's start with another lecture. So let's recall where we are. Recall that given any subgroup H and G, we can form cosets. Uh, so we can form a collection G mod H of cosets. Um, and then, of course, if H happens to be normal in G, then we have a group. If H is normal in G, then G mod H is a group. And of course, you take uh, G, the coset G1H times G2H is equal to G1G2H. And that's your, that's the uh, group composition law. Okay, so, let's see here. The order of, this, this is a completely separate statement. I should probably make this as a separate definition. The order of a group G is its size. And we write it as the absolute value of G. So like norm notation. Uh, but we call it the order, but just the number of elements in G. So it could be a finite number, it could be infinite. Uh, it can't be zero because groups have an identity element. And so any group is going to have order at least one, uh, possibly infinite. But most, most of the stuff that we talk about in group theory is with finite range, or finite groups. That, that's a lot of, especially this, uh, the preliminary stuff and the stuff that we're going to discuss in this lecture. So let's talk about some facts. So we can write G as the disjoint union over alpha in G mod H of G alpha H. Um, where, and I'll, I'll come back and talk about this notation, but G alpha H is, word, but rather G alpha is a, um, so G alpha or G alpha H? Uh, G alpha is a representative of the coset alpha. Because remember, alpha is an element of a collection of uh, equivalence classes. And so for each equivalence class, we choose some G alpha in there and form the coset this way. And of course, this means disjoint union. Um, and that's because... I, um, we're choosing the, do we really need this to be dis, yeah, I mean, it's disjoint union because every single coset is disjoint. Um, actually, let, let's just, let's just prove that. Um, if G1 is not equal to G2, or rather, um, If um, yeah, that it doesn't. We don't even really need to discuss it because uh, different cosets are disjoint because it's a, they're equivalence classes, and obviously equivalence classes partition a set, and so their intersection is going to be empty. So any any different. Uh, if you take any two elements of two equivalence classes here, their intersection is going to be empty. And so, yeah. So, this is a disjoint union. Sometimes we'll write 
Um, so this is one way I've seen disjoint union written. I've also seen it written as a union with the plus sign inside it. I've also seen it with brackets. Um, the union with the dot and union with the plus sign are notations I've learned from analysts, and so I'm probably going to use those. The brackety one I've learned from algebraists, so I'm probably going to avoid that. But it's just a personal preference. Um, they all mean the same thing. They all mean that we're taking a disjoint union. Anyways, enough about that. Um, so, uh, so then, if we put if we slap norms on both sides of this equation, what are we going to get? Left side is just going to get the norm of g. The right side. Um, we're going to get, okay, so we're taking the union over all elements in G mod, over all cosets in G mod H of G alpha H. So another thing that you can prove is that each coset is going to have the same size. So the size of G alpha H, or the, the size of G H is going to be equal to the size of H for any single element G and big G. And that's something that you can prove if it's not immediately clear to you. But, um, so every single coset's going to have the same size. Its size is going to be h. And there's g mod h of them. And so this ends up being g mod h times h. Um, so your g mod h, uh, so then we, we, we also have a, uh, a definition, the number of cosets, um, the number of cosets in G that we get by modding out by H, we're just going to write as uh, G colon H in parentheses. And this is the index of H in G. Now, you're not saving a lot of writing here, so I'm not super sure why we tend to go with that, but I don't know. It's just a notation. Um, okay. So, G mod H can be finite even if, uh, if G is not. For example... Um, uh, if we let g be the integers, then we can also let h be nz, so the integers, uh, uh, multiples, integer multiples of n for some n greater than or equal to zero, pause an integer, um, then we're going to have Uh, the the index of n z in the index of n z in z is going to be equal to n, which of course is finite. So that's that. Then we're going to have a corollary. Okay, so look, we have a subgroup here, H, and H times G mod H is equal to the order of G. And so the order of H divides the order of G. Um, and that holds uh, for any... This holds for any subgroup H in G um, because, let's see here, yeah, in, in this equation here, uh, the, the, this, this equality holds even if um, G mod H isn't a group. Even if it's just a set, it's still a collection of 
equivalence classes, and so everything still works out fine. So we have this. We have another definition, and I think I think I mentioned this previously, but we're going to go ahead and define it now. Uh, given some non-identity element a and g, um, the order of a. I'll, I'll write that out in words. The order of A is, so here my professor seems to like to write it as ORD A. I've, um, I believe in Jacobson he just does O of A, but this is a little weird because you try to avoid things that look like zeros in math because zero is such an important number. Um, or thing, since it's not always a number, it's sometimes just an identity element. Um, so, O of A. So anyways, this is the smallest K greater than zero, such that A to the K is the identity. So then, Okay, so corollary. Um, for all A in G mod E, no, 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 no. That's not mod. The slash is going the other way, so that's set minus. So G set minus E. So all elements of E which are not the identity element. Um, we have the order of A divides G. And that's just because um, A, um, we, we consider the subgroup generated by A. And that's just all powers of A. And if you look at the size of that, the size of that is going to be the order of A. Because once you, once you raise A to the power of the order of A, then by definition you're just back at E. And so you're, you've run out of uh, distinct elements. Uh, so anyways, this is a, because it's a subgroup generated by A, it's a subgroup. And so we, we use this corollary, and we know that its order divides G. Okay. So here's another co corollary. Um, if the order of G equals P, which is a prime, Supposing that its order is prime, then the only proper subgroup of G is just the trivial subgroup E. And that's because if you have any subgroup of G, its order has to divide the order of G. Um, but the order of G is P, which is prime. So if you have a subgroup, its order has to divide P. And if we're looking at proper subgroups, then if you have a proper subgroup, its order is not, since it's proper, the subgroup is not all of G. And so its order is strictly less than P. And the only thing strictly less than a prime which divides the prime is 1. And so therefore, this is a trivial subgroup. Alright, that looks like a good stopping point. And next time, we get to discuss group actions.